My name is Raj Lakhani. I am from Peri, India. We have three fantastic speakers here on the dais. And uh, the first speaker of the session, Mr. Ahmed Abdul Razak, who is the Executive Vice President of Samsung Construction and Technologies and uh, is absolutely fresh from the launch and the completion of the Burj Dubai. So please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Ahmed Abdul Razak. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction. Um, it's really, it's been a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, this is my first time um, in India. And um, it's just really, um, it's awakening call uh, for me. Um, today, I just, um, really, I, I have two, I don't know what, what I am sometimes. Am I a designer or am I a construction guy or am I a professor? I don't know. Um, and, and this lecture is what, what I'm going to focus on is um, some of the latest technologies that, that we use um, in the design and construction planning um, on tall buildings and what does it mean. Uh, many of you in the previous lectures have asked a lot of questions about technologies and how do we use them uh, today um, in tall buildings. So the intent here is using the cutting ink technologies for the design and construction planning for tall buildings and the role of the structural engineer, in particular, um, uh, this, uh, this instance. So now, as you know, um, you know um, the, the things that I'm going to cover is what are the factors that are really influencing the design of skyscrapers, uh, talk a little bit about sustainability, um, and what does it mean from structural engineering standpoint, especially when you go to super tall buildings. And... Um, um, the second one is really talking about, as a follow-up, is a structural system optimization. And, and what we have as engineers have gone through in order to optimize the system. And for me, what is right technically, it is right architecturally. And by itself, it, it, it presents things and that have beauties of it on, in itself. And one of the questions that came up today is, what are the present trends of architecture and what does it mean for tall building? So I'm going to comment on those a little bit. These key issues that influence the design of skyscrapers, as most of you know, is financial, which it has to be able to generate a profit, environmental, to improve the conditions of living in dense cities by creating large plazas, free more land, and more natural lights. And today, if you look around, and we have to think, what really are the things that drive the design of tall buildings? Is it free-form architecture? or is it form that follow functions? Or is it really the creation of a sculpture that we're after? Or is it the creation of dialogue between neighboring towers? Or is it restriction of sites and setbacks requirements? We see all of that. And today, more than ever, we talk about design sustainability and green architecture. And for me, I always pay, go back to the basic rule, what we are trying to get and achieve from all of that. The other thing is design engineering concepts, such as structural aesthetic, wind engineering, solar energy, sustainability, and green architecture. But what's the most important things? Also technologies, because tall buildings is always about technologies. Today, we have more technologies than we ever have before. And the question, how do we take these technologies and incorporate them in tall building planning, such as smart middle building materials that could change its characteristics for structural needs, dampings, dynamics, and many of these issues. Historically, obviously, most of you know, which I will not spend time uh, much on, is the skyscrapers have the power to capture the human imagination because of its scale, its symbolic nature, and to show the financial well-being and uh, the technologies and the potential for iconic representation of cities. And we recognize cities by their structures, by their high-rise buildings, going from Shanghai, um, and now uh, we have um, Incheon, um, uh, Korea, and Burj Dubai, obviously, um, is, is one of the last completed project. But if you look at all the buildings and what went on Dubai, it changed what we can do architecturally in the last four years. It's unbelievable. People never felt that they can do the architecture that they are producing today. But what happened in Dubai, it gave the people an understanding of realities. And one of the things I want to point to is, um, is related to, and now we're looking into new towers, 
and another desert land, which is supposed to be the tallest building in the world probably, is the Kingdom Tower, in the, in the hope of creating a financial catalyst in Jeddah. Structurally, technically, we are running into so many challenges as a structural engineers, as contractors. We've seen towers that are very tall, very slender. They're exhibiting a structural behavior that we have never experienced before. We're seeing structures that are complex, and we're seeing um, um, a lot of things that is being done in the name of sustainability. For me, I always wanted to, many of, the, many of you know this slides, obviously denser city tend to be more sustainable, um, considering the human population and the amount of increase of people that's expecting in the future, and we cannot keep spreading out, like you see in Tokyo or in Seoul or in Hong Kong. At some point, we have to come to a realization. If I take Burj Dawar, for example, this is a Marshall Strabel, a friend of mine, who had done some analysis on this, for example, if I take all these houses and trying to put them in a tower, the area that you need is about 2.4 um, million, 20, 24, um, it's a huge amount of area that you need to fit the same amount of housing that you put in a tower. And the question is, this is Burj Dubai. Look at the amount of space that it created from a sustainability standpoint. It's good. Why can't we do that? Tokyo, same way. We are, you know, many of the things that we, that, that we do today is related to this issue. And if we look at the amount of energy, this is taken again from other uh, speakers um, borrowed um, in the past. What we see is transportation, buildings, and industry. And the industry that makes the building pretty much control the majority of what we do from a sustainable standpoint. So the most important thing is how to utilize the material effect most effectively um, um, uh, in, the, you know, in the future and, and uh, from now on. If you look at the building pyramid, in terms of what are the most important things to deal about from a sustainability standpoint, there are many. The site is the most important. The building form, such as the aspect ratio, the core, the orientation, it has a huge impact in terms of the embodied energy that we have in the building. Building envelope, building services, Whatever we do in renewable energy, it's just the small aspects of what we are trying to achieve. So let's not miss the fact of that. Of that. For me, as a structural engineer, one of the most important things, and this is again from the Council on Tall Building and Urban Habitat, as the building gets taller, the most important aspect in terms of sustainability and energy saving is the structure. The taller the building gets, the more material you use. Everything else is remain uniform, right? So if I got a 100 and or 200 story building, the key element that I wanted to optimize is the structure. And you know, engineers historically have been um, great at doing that. Because if you look at the energy life cycle that in the embodied energy, pretty much the structure and uh, other component represent more than half of the lifetime of the building. So I'm not going to go into detail. I'm not a sustainability expert. But where I'm heading is the structural optimization of tall buildings. And tall buildings has historically been about using technologies that we are facing today. And the question, as we started from the beginning of civilization, we had a very simple structure made out of stone. We went into the Industrial Revolution. We got steel. And we built the tallest building in the world, not necessarily economically, but at least we built them, right? And then we got World War II, the second school of architecture, um, in which we have a new industry after World War II with better steel, better connection, better analytical techniques, better and so on and so forth. And, and the story goes on. Then we started shifting into more um, drifting away from this box, from this optimization. And the question is where we are today. Are we really better? You know, I look, always look at the history. What we have done in the past to make the building stand for the test of time. Look at these towers. How did people come up with these towers? Obviously, um, in the past, tower structures were made out of stone by master builders who demonstrated sensitivity to aesthetic, knowledge and techniques, and method of construction, understanding the social need and the economic uh, limitation. And they managed all phases of the construction. The master builder then was one man who did everything. He was the architect and the structural engineer. 
Today, we have it drifted, and we can no longer uh, provide that. So for me, looking at the history of engineering, Eiffel Tower is a great structure for many things. It really established all the rules of what we do as a structural engineer, as a structural optimization, from wind engineering, gravity engineering management, system optimization, combined mathematics, precision, patience, and at the same time, it used the construction methods. And today, if I give it this to the same contract, I say, you're crazy, can I build that? We see in these charts all the time, as the building get taller, more expenses, which means the embodied energy is increased. And it's our responsibility as a planners and engineer is trying to optimize the amount of material, not to go drift away, it's trying to find out the most optimum solution in building design in which I don't exceed what I need to design for wind or seismic by managing the gravity load, as you saw what happened in the Bush Dubai project. Obviously, Falzakan has developed beautiful techniques in terms of what is a, what's an optimum structure. There are the formulas. If you exceed these limits, then you have a problem in terms of uh, the structural system that you selected. But at the same time, he developed what is called the bundle tube system. Uh, this is a, probably is one of the most powerful structural system that you can achieve without compromising anything. But it's limited only by the creation of the architect, how clever they are, as long as you follow a structural solution. Obviously, these are the kind of things that you can do with it. I cannot get into the detail um, of that. And these use simple analysis technique that as good as we do in the present computer technologies, and other structural diagonalized systems. So structural engineers has always strived for what is the most optimum solution I can use in structural material. And we tend to now forget about that in, in some sense. Bank of China, Leslie Robertson, CPM engineers, locating the structural system at the outside and carrying the gravity load at the extremity to maximize the effective moment of inertia to use the least amount of material. The less you use, the better constructible, probably the better structure. And it doesn't have to be um, uh, that, that complicated. So we can go through on and on and on in terms of what, what engineers have used in the past uh, relative to the optimization of these structures. Jimma Tower, this building was designed almost with almost no penalty to the gravity load, to the, to the lateral system, even though it's in high typhoon and high seismic regions. Look at the plan. Good planning. Huh? architecture, structure, you almost cannot sense the, in, the, the two are intertwined so well together that there is no separation. It's designed with 75 kilogram per steel. Huh? In a, in a bit. And also architects start drifting away, let's try to do something more interesting and all kind of a grid. Obviously, all of these systems that you see with the diagrid are all uh, very practical. Again, we got this about 125 story, a student, one of my students, okay, how can I do it? Fabrication, constructability is very important. We can do diagrid. Don't let them carry a lot of a gravity load. Let them do what a web of, a, of an I-beam do and, and, and keep it efficient. So another student, 250th story that I did in which we investigated um, um, a lot of things uh, with them. Then come Burj Dubai. Look at that structure. Can you see the similarities? The core is empty has nothing in it, just like the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. And then you have the flow the load to the outside. The amount of material that you used in Porsche Dubai, it didn't exceed for the lateral system what we need for the gravity load. And that's real optimization in terms of using material like you heard previously with Bill Baker. As an engineer today, we're faced with a, good, with a lot of questions. Is it really steel that we're going to use, or is it concrete, or is it composite? What kind of structural system we need to look at? Today, as in engineers, we are, have many, many available technologies, structural materials, high-performance concrete, high-performance steel, post-tensioning, fire-resistant, casting, composites. As in engineers, we're thinking about too many things, computer technologies, structural system optimization, health monitoring program. It can give us everything we need, smart systems, Damping, base isolation, smart material that changes characteristics with time. Architects are constantly changing, looking for things that are lighter, that are better, that are more efficient. And I think wound engineering, 
the engineers have to think about how to control the dynamics, seismic engineering, such as performance-based design, and, and special detailing, extreme events. U.S. codes obviously did not address those very well, but now we are getting into those as a part of performance-based design system. Structural detailing, redundancy, and robustness. So as a structural engineer, we're designing all these buildings, have to think about all of these matter in developing the ideal structural system for the support tall building in order to get an optimum solution that works very well. And the question comes back, is it steel or is it clear concrete? With damping or without damping? Obviously, what we have with the present materials, composite is good, high strength concrete is good, and practically you can evaluate them very clearly from the early design concept. Now we're drifting apart from the traditional method of all tall building being an office building, it become residential, it become composite, we have concrete, we have steel, and we're seeing it drift away from steel construction into more of a concrete construction. Why? High performance concrete, it has a strength, model of elasticity, mass, damping, moldability, cost effectiveness because of the speed of construction that it can provide such as a climbing form system, slip form system, connectivity, self-compacting, uh, carbon fiber, high strength, we can do all of that. We can essentially, like we did in Burj Dubai, mold and extrude the building by using concrete as a single member without having to worry about the issues that you deal with with other things. Gravity engineering, uh, obviously the other portion that, that I would recommend strongly for all architects that do very special structure is the wind engineering. The wind engineering is, they can be deadly and they can be benign. It all depends on how you work with your architect in controlling the wind effects. It's very simple formula, through a number. Many of you engineers probably don't know what that means, but it's very simple. If you can disorganize how it forms along the height of the building, then you have succeeded. Because optimizing the building dynamics, providing the building spectral, disorganize the vortex shedding by providing surface treatment. And a lot of time, many of you probably, and these are the other things that we can do, is practically these are wind engineering treatment and a surface that can add to the architecture, as you will see in a minute. This is a student thesis. It's as tall as Burj Dubai. It was done in 1998, his thesis, 96, the program, and one of it is driven. I told them, you can do anything you want, come up with the building that changes its shape. Square plan. And essentially what you end up being a very twisted building with very simple a plan. And essentially the structural system and the architecture is controlled together as one without separation. And it was a perfect harmony. Bleeding, tapering, and this is the student thesis that you see here. It's a very simple plan in the middle, it drifted from here to here with exterior diagonal. Very, very, very efficient structural system, but it follows good logic, it follows engineering, it follows wind engineering, it follows structural optimization. Another building that we had done in Songdo Tower, and which followed the basic engineering principle, you can create a very beautiful building by doing that. Burj Dubai is another example of all of that research. It started out of this building. Okay. And practically, if you take, initially, uh, probably you heard, Bill, we didn't know how high that building was. So we needed to create a structure that you can expand without necessarily changing the architecture. This is Tower Palace 3, the initial concept. This is Burj Dubai. So there's a huge correlation where you can extend it from experience and apply it in the new technologies. Obviously, some of the things that we've done um, in Burj Dubai is, I, I'm going to skip over uh, just uh, uh, so many things, but... What you will see here is changing the shape is very important. In the chimneys, what do we do to control the wind? Spoilers, right? Look at Burj Dubai. It's a spoiler, just exactly like you do in a chimney. And that by itself, it controlled the wind effect on the tower and it played a major role in, in controlling that. And now we're going into CFDs, wind dynamics. Um, and, and we can get a lot of answers out of, out of these, so I'm going to skip over. But adding opening around the corner and so on and so forth to make the building a little bit better. The question is come down to dynamics and damping. This is always a question. Do we use damping or not? 
for me today, damping is a cheap, it becoming a very, very cheap solution. And there is no reason for people not to incorporate it if they can, okay? So I think damping is very important. It's provide uh, very high dependability. It used to solve a problem. Uh, today, we are exceedingly using uh, the, the, the damping system as part of the dynamic of the building. Before, we designed structure in a simple way. Now, it's very, very complicated. So essentially, it become more of a building control uh, system. And these are examples of how we use viscoelastic dampers, uh, tune mass dampers, uh, dampers that have been used to control the dynamic of the building under seismic zones uh, to, to actually keep the building more or less in the elastic range. And here what we have is we're looking even for these buildings. Again, um, now I'm still struggling with the architect. Oh, should we add these dampers or not? And obviously, they have a huge benefit. It doesn't uh, necessarily, and this is one of the questions that we are uh, looking at for this uh, very support tower in, 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 in June. What you will see here, obviously, the difference in behavior with having um, a damping system at the key location and the, the significant difference that you can modify at a very limited amount of cost. So I'm going to skip because of time. And support tall building, vertical cities in the sky. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it very efficiently. We can do it well. We can add dampings. We can add all kinds of things. Obviously, the stability should never be compromised, but can be added as a supplementary damping to ensure. Obviously, the construction method, developing ideal construction. Now, when you do all of this, the structural engineer is saying, thing, but I need to think about constructability of the building. I cannot just be over there and not worry about how am I going to build the building. So you need to think about what are the ideal construction methods that are going to incorporate. Most designers will not include that. But having an involvement in, in a contractor, a later part of the process, make a huge difference in terms of construction techniques, how to best build the building, what are the different techniques from high speed. Um, uh, you know, and, and it can be adopted and incorporated into the design uh, before we get into such as cover crane, number of lift. Why designer want to do that? Because you want to build the building quickly, efficiently, incorporating the most and the latest technological advances in construction material. It means saving time, saving money. Expedite sequence. As you're working on the design, the contractor is thinking, okay, how can I expedite the construction activities of the formwork and eliminate uh, major activities out of the critical path and how do we build the steel, how we incorporate all of that. So you don't need, as designer, you don't need to do this, but a lot of time incorporating this, it makes a huge difference to the performance of the project. Obviously, so many of you probably hoping what we did for Burj Dubai, obviously, it was a very tall tower. Um, you know, we have to build it very fast, very quickly, and we had a very, very strategic approach. Three-day cycle, optimum transportation system, optimum forward, well-organized logistics and plans. What are the three-day cycle? We looked at everything under the sun in order to achieve that, whether ACS, up-up method, column, uh, and so on and so forth, high-strength concrete, and... And, um, you know, the construction method, as you can see, the construction of the tower is just like manufacturing plant. Everything ticks. Everything planned. Everything worked like beautifully as anything. Um, so because of the lack of time, obviously, ACS form uh, system, prefabricated um, uh, rebar and lifted up so we, don't, we reduce the amount of labor that we do at the top of the tower, so do most of the fabrication on the ground, lift it up in position, a drop head system to speed up the construction, and concrete planning work was a huge amount of work that was done in coordination with the construction, um, with, the, with the designers, uh, in order to make sure that we never miss anything. And nobody, from beginning of the construction up to the end, can ask any question, how am I gonna cure the slab, how am I gonna do this, how am I gonna do that? We did all kind of testing from the early design concept. Obviously, Bill spoke about, we spend a huge amount of time related to the, what kind of mix design we have uh, in order to optimize the pumping and make sure the characteristics of the concrete remain intact when we pump it to about 600 meter in the air. We did all kind of creep and shrinkage studies to ensure uh, that we got the behavioral characteristics of the concrete that we wanted. Full scale testing related to the concrete, the curing, uh, what have you, full scale. Uh, pumping test um, relative to the um, to, to ensure that the concrete uh, can be pumped up to the highest level, and these are just um, some of the pumps that uh, that we use there. Okay, I'll give me one one more minute. Okay, I'll skip on Burj. Um, you know, one of the questions that that we always ask 
um, is, is related to um, where do we go with, with, um, with the new um, uh, over here. So one of the things that we did is one of the biggest mega research project and that ever existed in tall buildings is uh, created a very detailed monitoring program for foundation, for horizontal monitoring, vertical monitoring, um, uh, and, and give us a feedback on the behavioral characteristics of the building in real time. And now we are installing a real-time monitoring program to look at the actual dynamic characteristics of the building um, from foundation, from seismic to wind, and what have you. And these are some of the strain gauges that, you, that we see today. Um, okay, um, the question is, um, computer technologies and where we're we heading with it. You know, obviously, uh, Frank Gehry's structure with, with the Guggenheim Museum has it changed what we do. And I was with SOM, we did the structural design um, on that building, and that's what we see today as a free form architecture. Um, all of these is a change, is adding really a structure, adding a huge amount of uh, challenges to us as, 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 as builders in terms of what you do, how you build them, how you erect them, how you, um, and, and is the sustainability really uh, need? So what we have is a huge amount of um, forces that are generated because of this unusual form. And it's a huge penalty that you're paying for nothing, almost, because of the shape, um, unusual shape of the building. And when you look at the CCTV, who's responsible for the design? Is it the designer or is it the contractor? What impact has the lateral movement on the building performance? We have to think about that, and, and the question is um, that that uh, actually have uh, something to think about because it has applied huge challenges uh, for us. Now we see building like that, small at the bottom, top at the top, and it's happened that we were fortunate enough to look at this building. A lot of problem with the curtain wall, a lot of problem with the lateral movement, and what one of the things that we looked at is these buildings are becoming to control very low seismic, they're being controlled by seismic. Do you know the biggest drift in the building? Is it wind or seismic? It's a gravity load. And how do you, especially in a concrete building, how do you control the building services long term? These buildings are become dynamics. In other words, if people moving in and out, you get the huge amount of forces that are being generated in the building that we have to be careful with. And I got lucky to work in a different building, again, Zaha Hadid, uh, in fact, uh, the building initially was really badly designed. It, the cost of the structure was about 50% of the total cost of the building. The client was very concerned. They came and talked to us, and essentially we reorganized the entire design of the building, and we were able to reduce the cost by about 30%. And that, one last project, here. Is this steel concrete, composite? Can you guess where the elevators are? Obviously, the initial concept was a concrete building, and we were able to change it and, and able to make it a little bit more uh, efficient and, uh, and, and efficient. Again, uh, these are the kind of things that we do, uh, we had done with the, with the corner and the, con and the designers to make the building economically uh, more feasible. Today, for me, Harris building has to be, design should be responsible, sustainable, functional, and conceptual. We cannot overlook these ideas. And you still can get very beautiful building without having to go through these. Obviously, a lot of time with this building, you need the special people that can provide you support as a designer. And integration for tall and complex building structure, you need to get the contractor early in the design process to, to minimize potential risk, construction risks, maximize the construction the potential for cost and saving for the client, ultimately. And that's what we do, is the trying to optimize the building structure. Again, I'm not gonna go into, into this, um, um, and with Samsung, we, we started doing a lot of that in which we get involved early in the design process, in which ultimately we can save the client a lot of time and cost. They're doing everything that the designer do, but at the same time work with them to give the best maximum benefit to the client. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I had to skip through this very quickly. Yeah.